uh, preach and continue our message. Last week we talked about overcoming temptation, and uh, so today is going to be overcoming temptation part two. Uh, does that sound like a good sermon title? I don't know. But uh, let's pray this morning before we open the word. God, we are grateful that you have gathered us together. We're grateful for all the things that you're doing. And Father, I'm, I'm grateful that you have a voice. God, that you speak to us. God, you aren't like uh, idols of this world that are silent and cannot move and cannot do things for us. But Father, you are one that speaks. And Father, whenever you speak, you speak truth. Father, it's always encouraging. It always lifts us up. Father, so I pray this morning that your words would be heard. Father, that we would hear from you, and God, our lives would be changed. Father, we know that whenever we hear your voice, God, it always causes goodness to, to flow. So, Father, we pray that in Jesus' name, that goodness would flow from your words this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's turn to the passage that we started with last week again. We're in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, starting in verse 13. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, and we're going to start there in verse 13. And I opened last week with a little bit of a, a story about uh, the stickiness. I'm, I'm starting to get a part-time job at, at Curry in the Box. And so every morning we come into the, to the Curry Box and I have to dip sweet and sour sauce. And sweet and sour sauce isn't just delicious on your egg rolls. It's also the most sticky substance ever to work with. And no matter how hard I try to get it just right in the cups, it always ends up getting on something, whether it's my finger, the, the table that I'm working on, always. And, and I mentioned about this game I used to play called Sticky Situations. <laughs> and uh, as, a, as a kid, I used to play this at, uh, at home. We had a little thing. And so I found the Sticky Situation game. Or actually, I went over to Mom and Dad's house, and, uh, and we went down to the basement and we were searching for this game, Sticky Situations. So we found the cards. And I was, I was, just like I said last week, it was so, so such a hard, so hard, uh, these questions that they asked. One of them was like, you know, you go over to a friend's house, and they want to watch, or no, you're going out to the movies, and you tell your parents you're going to watch a rated G movie, and all of your friends get to the movie theater, and they want to watch a rated PG-13 movie, what are you going to do? And has like five different scenarios of, of what you're going to do. Are you going to stand up for what's right? Are you going to... You tell them you're not going to watch that, or you're going to just go with them and think everything's okay. And then another, another really hard situation, sticky situation. I know all of us in this room deal with this, right? So we tell our neighbor that we're going to babysit for them on a Friday night. And then you find out that your friends are having a party on Friday night. So you have to decide, what are you going to do? Are you going to call your neighbor and tell them you can't babysit for the night? Or are you going to keep your word and be a good kid and, and watch the kids for the night? And so I was going through the cards and me and Rachel were just laughing the whole time of these different, different situations. And I remember as a little kid, this game was so hard for me to decide, what am I going to do? And I know that us, as we grow though, our situations and things that we find ourselves in, they're a little bit more difficult on whether to, or not to watch a movie or not, or whether or not to watch somebody's kids and keep our word. But it, it, those, those principles though, they continue as we grow. And sometimes we find ourselves even in, in situations that uh, the enemy would want us to get trapped in to betray the character of God in our lives. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 10 last week gave us hope. It gave us encouragement, and we're going to continue this to say there is encouragement, there is hope in the middle of a um, situation where we find ourselves and the enemy is tempting us, wanting us to portray God's character in our lives. Uh, but there's hope, there is a way out, there is a way of escape. So let's look at the word this morning again, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. Right? He is faithful. He's good to us. Yeah. He's faithful to us. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. That gave me hope. You know, sometimes I get in situations, right? And I, I, I said, man, this is, really, this is really difficult. This is hard. This decision, whether to, uh, whether to cheat on this situation or not, or to do it the right way, especially, I don't know, anybody else around tax season, and I do my own taxes, so sometimes I have to decide, okay, am I going to fudge that number a little bit, because I know if I did it this way, it would benefit me a little bit more. If I did it the right way, maybe I wouldn't get that quite benefit. I don't know if anybody else in the room. But even in that situation, I said, I, there's a temptation that comes that I can bear, that I can handle. I don't know, it's really hard. Sometimes we get into what I'm looking at or what I'm entertaining in my mind, the way I entertain those who are around me and those are my neighbors and my wife or my spouse or my children and the thoughts that I have towards them. But it says, uh, the temptations that I 
have are not beyond what I can bear. That gives me hope. But when you are tempted, again, showing the goodness of God, but when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Right? There's hope this morning. Last week we went over the message of the temptations of Jesus. Right after His baptism, Satan comes to Him and tempts, him, tempts His identity. Each time, asking Him, are you really the Son of God? Is it really true? If so, turn this uh, rocks into bread. Satisfy your immediate desires. Right? And he went on after that, and, and he said, take him to the temple, and he said, hey, throw yourself off of this building. You know that God will protect you. It's written that, that God will protect you. And in, in that moment, he was, Satan was trying to get Jesus to take pride and to take uh, ownership of a promise and try to uh, use God's promises, use God's goodness for his benefit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we find ourselves in that same temptation. Oh, I know this... This is going to be a sin, but I know that God is good, so He could forgive me if I did this. Right. And we, we've learned how there, there's hope in that, that we can stand on the promises, the identity that God has given us before we even sin, before we even break that character with God. And then God, Satan took him to the next temptation and showed Jesus the kingdoms of this, this world. They took him to a high mountain and showed him all these wonderful, glorious things. And when He showed him these things, he said, if you worship me, I'll give you all of this. Right. But what was a really unique thing about Jesus, and for each one of us individuals we talked about last week, is we already have yeah. all those things. Right. If we belong to Jesus, we have an inheritance. And sometimes the enemy will come to us and lie to us. He'll show us, as I said, the glory of things, but not the worries of it. Mm -hmm. Right? So sometimes he'll show us how good something will be if we were to take part in this sin. But it doesn't show us the cares of it. Okay, he showed us the kingdom. He showed the kingdoms to Jesus, but it doesn't show the people and the cares, and the, the the work that it's going to take to obtain that thing. And sometimes when we're about to sin, and when the enemy is trying to capture us, he shows us how great it would be, how good it would be for us to receive these things, to partake in this sin, these things that portray God's character. But it doesn't always show us that sometimes when we do that, there's a care factor, there's a consequence, there's things that we have to take care of. But we said in all of this, there's hope if we stand on the identity that we've been given by Jesus and by God Himself. So this morning we're going to look at a couple other ways. What are some hope? What are some ways? If there's a way of escape, what is it? So let's turn this morning, and we're going to go to uh, 2 Timothy 2, 2, or 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Second Timothy two, verse twenty-two. And this word is repeated. Uh, there's a couple different verses. This word is repeated over and over again. But what is the way of escape for us? Starting in verse twenty-two, it says this: Flee. <laughs> Flee. There's a way of escape for you. There's a temptation that overcomes you. Sometimes it bears, it bears down on you and, and, and it's tempting. It looks really appealing to the eye. It looks really appealing to the desires in our heart. And what does the Word of God say? It says, flee. Flee evil desires of the youth. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of the pure heart. And so what does it say? It says, flee. Get, rid, get out of the situation. You find yourself in a room, and you're all alone, and you're feeling lonely, and you're tempted. Hey, maybe something on this uh, internet screen would appease me. And they said, no, I want to flee. I want to get out, get out of the house. Close the laptop. Run from it. Flee. Right? Okay, so then, then it goes, then we, we can see in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 18, and again, it says, flee from sexual immorality. Flee from it. Get out of the way. Then I'm in a situation, I find myself in this, uh, uh, a, a group of people that I'm always around and they're always talking crudely and whenever I'm around them as they're talking about um, uh, things that are inappropriate for somebody that wants to reflect God's character what I'm, I want to find some new a new friend yeah. I want to find new people to get around I'm going to flee I'm going to get out of that situation i got to get away yeah. because I'm, I, I, this is like the, this is the most basic way sometimes it's, it's, but sometimes we we find and we're going to look at this sometimes we find inside ourselves we don't want to flee well then we're going to examine that a little bit yeah. but there's
there's some words here that says a flee. That's our greatest defense. If we get away from what the enemy is trying to tempt us to do, tempt us to say, tempt us to think about, we gotta, we got to change some habits sometimes. And maybe that's not the most popular thing to say in uh, today's church environment. But I said, you know, sometimes we've got to change our habits. Sometimes we've got to change who we're hanging around. Sometimes we've got to change what we're listening to and, and what our eyes are seeing. The enemy, that's what he did to, to Jesus, right? He, he said, hey, look at all these things. It looks really good. Sometimes we've got to change what we're looking at. Yes. Sometimes we've got to change what we're hearing. If, there's, if the only influence that you're hearing are things that are going to be contrary to the character of God, then it's going to begin to come out of you. Because what you put into yourself, it says, then out of the bottom of the heart. Now you start speaking this way. Now I'm starting to act this way. Sometimes I find myself along the way, and I said, where did I get to this point? Remember, we, we said, oh, how did I get to this? I don't know how Satan got Jesus to on the top of the temple. I don't know how it happened. Sometimes I find myself in the middle of a temptation. I said, I don't know where I got this. So we got to begin to examine what's going on in our life. Mm -hmm. What are the, I hate to say it. No, I'm not, I don't hate to say it. So what are the media? What are, we, what are we listening to? What are we watching? What an influence in our life. All of a sudden, some things start coming out of our mouths. So when I was a little kid, um, in, in my house, we, we weren't able to, to listen to any artists that weren't from a, a Christian perspective. And so, um, I don't know if Dad's ever told me, heard me say this story, but that's all right. Uh, so, I, I tell this all the time to college students. So, we, we knew that, hey, we weren't, a, we weren't able to watch you know, MTV, uh, BET, any, any of these uh, uh, TV stations, there's music that we, we weren't able to watch. So I would love, I would fall asleep to worship music at night and if to listen to some Christian rap artists and things of that nature, right? But there was a season in my high school time where I said, you know what, I wonder what it would be like. And I'm, I'm an experimental person. I like, I loved taking physics. I would do some experiments and say, okay, I wonder, how. Oh, it, what, what will happen if I do this or that? And so specifically when it came to spiritual things, I was the same way. I said, I wonder what it would be like. So I want to journal and find out. If I watch MTV for this month straight, what will be the results of this? <laughs> you guys are all laughing. You know, like nobody else did that? No spiritual experiments? What the results of that? I said, if my parents had told me these things are so terrible, i got to find out. I didn't do an experiment, so I journaled. And I would, I would journal day one. I watched this for 30 minutes. And then would write down, okay, these were the, re the results. This is how I felt when I was watching it. This was, this was the interactions I had with my family members. These were the things I did with my friend. Everybody's laughing at me. Okay, so it went, it went, it went on. It was like day number, I don't, I don't remember what the day was. I think it was around day 22, right? So I'm with my friends, and uh, and if you're around me a lot, you, you know that, especially growing up, maybe none of you guys were around me, but I, I wasn't one that, that, that cursed or, or sent me weird things. I love Jesus. I was really passionate about him, even at a young age. So I remember getting on the bus, and I had a good friend. His name was William, and me and William <laughs> would do a lot of things together. We'd play like WWE on the, on the uh, a game console every once in a while. We would walk through the neighborhoods. We'd get to school together. It was it was a good time, and and so there was one one day I don't remember um, what we were discussing even. I don't even know that. But we were day around twenty two of this whole experiment for me. Okay, what's going to happen if I actually listen to this music that my parents had forbidden me to to listen to? And I remember dropping an f bomb on my way getting into the bus. We were talking about something, and then. <laughs> And then I had a really good friend, William, we, we did everything, and he looked at me and goes, What did you just say? <laughs> that ain't you! <laughs> and so it was, a, it was a really good moment. I, was like, I, didn't, I didn't have to finish the seven days. I said, all right, think, things in my life are different. I said, when I'm, when, but I would also do the opposite side of experiments. Okay, if I, if I read the word, Joshua um, 111 says that when you read the word, our ways will be prosperous and successful. So then I would do experiments with that. Okay, what would it look like if every day I would be in the Word of God, I would be passionately pursuing who He is in worship and in, in the Word. And I said, and everything went better for me. Man, my friends, we would have greater times of laughing, we would, we would get in deeper conversation about who God is. I mean, grades would be better, all those different situations. I said, okay, that's good when I'm in high school. How does that apply now? I'm you know, an adult, I have jobs, I have bills, I have responsibilities. I don't have kids yet, but some of us in the room, we're like, we have kids, and, and there's can provide some headaches sometimes. I know that, I've, I've learned from other parents in the room. And so, 
In these situations, our pursuit of who God is, it must be over the pursuit of the enemy. When, we're, when we begin to influence ourselves with, with the character of God, it begins to, re it begins to create in the, a resistance to these temptations that come our way. Yes. We're going to find this out today in Scripture. So let's look th this morning at James chapter 4, verse 7. James chapter 4, if you have time in your own uh, to read this, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing chapter about this struggle that we have in, against the enemy who would love for us to live a life that betrays the character of Jesus. So we're in James chapter 4. And I love this. It opens up James chapter 4, verse 1. It says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Do they come from your desires that battle within you? And he's going to tell us the end of that little rhetorical question. Do, do the things that go against God in your life, do they battle within you? Do, are they from the desire that you have in your heart? Verse 2, it says, You desire, but do not have, so you kill. So some of our sins, some of the way that the enemy tempts us is because we have some desires that are actually within us that aren't met. And so we end up backing out on them. You desire, but you don't have, so you kill. Some people, they covet. They desire things that aren't theirs. But we can't get what you want. Sometimes maybe you guys are going through something like that. You, you, have, you know there's something that somebody has and you want it. You're coveting after it. You're seeking after it. And so then... In your life, you causes you to quarrel and to fight and to pursue that thing so you could obtain it. it. Continues, you do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So we have taught this over uh, the course of the year and uh, over some time that that. God desires to give us the desires of our heart. We even read that scripture this morning. We said that Jesus is the one that will satisfy our every desire. But what it says here is sometimes we don't go to Him to receive those desires, to satisfy those desires. You do not have because you do not ask God. This morning you say, sometimes I find myself alone and I, the enemy tempts me with something that would be contrary to God's character to satisfy that loneliness in my heart. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a pursuit of business, it's a pursuit of position, maybe it's a pursuit in academia that you are desiring to achieve because you know once you achieve that position or you get that degree or you have that thing underneath your belt that now you'll receive the respect that you desire. But you know if you go after it in the earth, if you just go after these positions, if you just go after the degrees, just in your flesh, it says actually once you get them, you won't be satisfied. The only way that you'll be satisfied is to know that there's a Father in Heaven who loves you, and that He has the greatest, uh, he, has a, he has the greatest respect for who you are, apart from anything you've done. That's right. He doesn't look at your awards or positions or certificates or degrees. He looks at who you are and He says, actually, I desire you. Yeah. I want to befriend you. I don't care who you are. I don't care your experiences. I desire you. But if we don't search for Him to satisfy that desire, then it says here that we go after other things. We tire ourselves out mm -hmm. trying to achieve these things. He says this, to ask, and to ask for the right motives. Ask to be satisfied by Him. It goes on, verse 4 through 5, talking about how we can go after adulterous things, and you can become, and you can have enemy between you and God. It says in verse 6, though, but He gives us more grace. God gives us grace. For God opposes the proud, but He shows favor to the humble. Remember that picture of Jesus sitting on, standing on top of the temple, and Satan tries to tempt him, hey, jump off this uh, temple peak because you know that if you jump off, God will save you, right? He was trying to get him to jump and to take things into his own hand. 
It says here, God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. When we try to do things in our own strength, when we try to, to satisfy our desires on our own, uh, in our own strength and in our own ways, and not according to the character of who God is, God actually opposes us. He resists us. But when we humble ourselves before him and we say, God, I desire you and nothing else, he begins to satisfy those things that are yes. within us. Yes. And sometimes it doesn't make sense that I don't, I, I can't really put my thumb on it. I can do more experiments if I wanted to. I can't really figure it out. But I know that when I seek who God is, all of a sudden within me, those desires that I had to do things that would please myself, would please my flesh, they begin to wane. They begin to go away. They begin to lessen. And my desire for Him continues to grow. It says this in verse 7. It says this. Submit yourself then to God. So how do we flee? How do we resist the enemy? How do we flee from him? Submit yourself to God. Resist the enemy. Resist the devil. Put a break on it. You know, anybody who obeys the enemy's promptings, anybody who falls into temptation, uh, the enemy is drawing us, the, uh, the only people that, that do that, they, the enemy always follows you. So if you give in to the temptations to follow your flesh, the only result of that is that you would get more of the enemy. That's right. The enemy goes with you. Yeah. But once we resist him, guess what happens? Then the responsibility of fleeing is actually on him. See, when we follow into these temptations, we actually give him permission to continue to tempt us. Amen. To continue to convince us to fall into these sins. To continue to get us to be contrary to the character of God in our life. But the moment that we put on the brakes, the moment that we say, resist, we resist these temptations, we say, wait a second, I am a child of God. I don't need you to satisfy me. The moment that we say, no, I am going to be satisfied in who God is <coughs> rather than in these things of the world, the enemy actually is the resistance. The, the stop is put on him, and he then has to flee. Powerful thing. Amen. That's a powerful thing to seek after God. Now let's look here. Verse 8 continues. It says this Come near to God, and He will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Isn't that good? So if we follow into temptation, if we go after the evil desires of our flesh, Right? Then as we do those things, the only result of that is to get more of the enemy. He goes with us. But if we draw near to God, to His goodness and to His character, what happens? God actually comes near to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We get more of His character in our life. We get more of Him. The things of our life, the things that bothered us before, they seem to fade away. The desires that were contrary to God's goodness, they, they fade away. We get more of God, and when we get more of God, it's always good. It always tastes good. It always feels good. It always changes my emotions. It always changes my situation. It's always good. Flee. So what is our way out? One is to flee. Get out of there. Change the situation. Find some new friends. Get some new media. Now get, out, get out of there. Second is to resist the enemy. Hey, I'm not going to give in to this. I'm going to say, no, I'm going to stand my ground on who God is. I'm going to stand my ground. I'm going to resist you, enemy. Because I know if I follow after you, if I, if I, if I am convinced to cheat on this situation, if I'm convinced to lie, if I'm, if I'm convinced to, to cause quarrel and arguments in my family and my household, if I'm convinced to bring my children to anger, if I do these things, if I follow you, enemy, I'm only going to get you. And you aren't good. That's right. And I'm determined in my heart, I'm not going to, I'm resisting what you're going to say to me. And I'm going to go hard after God, right? So let's look in uh, Romans chapter 7. Because there's this discourse that goes on in Romans chapter 7. Paul is talking about this uh, situation in his life. Sometimes he's doing things that, that don't quite line up with the character of God. And he finds himself in these situations over and over again. And he says, man, sometimes I know that I shouldn't desire to do this, but sometimes I still do them anyway. And, oh, there's just, ah, this tension. And, and maybe you're in this room as you're listening. You're saying, yeah, Andrew, 
I, I want to be uh, that person that resists the enemy. I want to be that person that flees. And, and you find yourself like Paul does here, or reads this, uh, in this situation where sometimes these desires are still going after me. Sometimes I'd still rather do something contrary to who God is than to follow who God is. And, and I, I want some freedom. So this morning, we're going to examine this in Romans chapter 7 to find why is it why is it that I still find these desires, these temptations? Because if Jesus says, and if the Word says in 1 Corinthians that there is a way out, I want that way out. Yeah. I think that we're in this room because we said, hey, we want the way out. We want to find out how we can resist this, how we can change this, because God wouldn't tell us there's a way out if there wasn't. God wouldn't tell us that we could resist the enemy if we couldn't. But this morning there's hope because we can. Mm -hmm. Let's examine why is it? Why do I have these things going on in my life? So we're in Romans chapter 7. We're starting in verse 14. And we're going to read here a little bit of a, a lengthy thing. And I, I hope that you can follow along with me this morning. Because Paul puts out this argument and he ends it in such a beautiful way. That we're going to find this morning is going to bring us that hope and bring us that help that we need. We find ourselves also in this tension between what God would desire us to do and what we find ourselves doing. So Romans chapter 7 verse 14 says this, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. Let me find yourself, I want to follow God. Find sometimes I do not follow that. But I hate what I do. Sometimes I find myself, it's a temptation. I do it. I do this sin. But I hate it. I really don't want to do something that's contrary to who God is. Verse 16. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Sometimes I identify with that statement. I desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. Verse 21. So I find this law at work with me. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against me, the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Sometimes I feel that way after I've committed something contrary to God. I, I hate the fact that I've just done something that opposes who God is, and I feel like I am so wretched, I'm, I'm so terrible, God, I don't even deserve to entertain who you are in this moment. And it says this, Who will rescue me from the body that is subject to death? How are we going to get out of this? How are we going to get out of this situation? I know if I understand the character of God, that He's good. Uh, the Bible also talks us that, the Bible says that God is holy. So He's perfect in every way. And I know if I follow Him, my desire also is to be perfect just as He is perfect. I want to be good. I want to follow his character. In the Bible, it also brings, uh, reminds us of some commandments, some things that can identify to us, hey, you're off the track. One of them is that we shouldn't lie. One of them is we shouldn't even have lust in our eyes. One of them is that we shouldn't steal. We shouldn't covet what other people have. We shouldn't worship things other than God. We should honor our mothers and fathers. We should keep the Sabbath day holy. And so those markers Paul is writing about, he says, they tell me, they remind me that I am not quite like God yet. 
So I find myself in this situation. I find myself asking this question in verse 24. I say, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? What is my hope? What is my escape? What is my way out? Verse 25. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you God for Jesus that rescues me, that delivers me, that changes my desires, that helps me to seek God more than I seek my own desires in my heart. <coughs> But I posed a question right before we read this passage, Romans 7. What is it that's within me? What is it that causes me to continue to sin? What is it that causes me to continue to fall into temptation, that continues to do things that reflect, that do not reflect who God said in his character? In verse 20, it says this. Now if I do what I now if I do what I don't want to do. It's no longer I who do it, but it is a sin living in me. Sometimes this is hard for me. If I, if, I, if I say I'm a follower of Jesus, that I have made a decision to follow Jesus for the rest of my life, I, I have received the forgiveness of Jesus, and I've made him the Lord of my life. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian. If you, may, you have made a decision... I'm going to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. He's going to be the leader. He's going to be the authority in my life. I'm going to receive the forgiveness that he's done. But sometimes I find that there's still sin in my heart. See, oftentimes the enemy will tempt us in our weaknesses. We, we talked about that. Oftentimes he will tempt us to do things that, that are contrary to God's character. Sometimes he will tempt us to take advantage of God's goodness. But sometimes, there's places in my heart that I have given the enemy legal ground to tempt me. I've held on to certain sins. Well, this isn't that bad. Or, hey, I'm going to continue to follow and fall into this. I'm going to do this. And we've actually given the enemy, we said, enemy, it's okay. In this area of my life, you can, you can tempt me all you want. We've got a contract here. And it's okay. We've allowed sin to live in our heart. We've allowed the fleshly desires to still stay there. We said, you know, I, I, I'll do my bit. I'll, God, I'll give you all of this. I am going to do it. I'll give you a, how I work. I'll, I'll give you my family. I'll give you all these things. But, but God, I'm just going to keep this little area of my heart to myself. I'm going to keep this desire because I kind of enjoy it. If we get honest this morning, sometimes thinking, uh, being honest with God is sometimes hard because sometimes when we say it, we're like, wow, I can't believe I actually believe that or I actually said it. But, but to be honest, sometimes we've given the enemy room still. Give him an authority. Give him a green light. It's all right, you can tempt me in this area we've got a contract. There's sometimes sin still living in me. This morning I believe that the Holy Spirit is one that He is the one that convicts us of sin and righteousness. He's the one that tells us, hey, when things are not lining up with the character of God, He's, he's really good at that. And he, he does that gently, I believe. It's not something that He comes and I don't know what your image of who God is, if you see Him as an authoritative man sitting on a throne waiting to just judge us and to slam us into hell and punishment. I hope that's not the view that you have of Him. We take it very seriously here at Catholic City Church that a God in heaven is not just an authoritative man, but he's a father. And sometimes we have a wrong image. Maybe the life that we've lived, the family that we've grown up with, the, the father that we've had, maybe isn't the best picture of, of who a father would be. But when I think about a father, I think about one who has arms that are wide open. I, I would love moments when I was younger and even now to go over to the dad's house and, and to be able to get into his arms and, and, and to be able to talk and, and to be able to relate with one another. And that's the kind of God that we serve. Though he is perfect, though he is holy, and though he is good, he loves to entertain us. He loves to have us in his presence. He loves for us to come close. And so this morning he may be showing you an area of your heart that you say, yeah, there's still an area that I haven't allowed him to come into. There's still an area that I've given the enemy green light to. So what now, Andrew? How do I find, in verse 25, 
Paul says, thanks be to God who delivers us through Jesus Christ our Lord. How do I find this deliverance? How do I find this freedom? Step one this morning. Because we must talk to him. So there's things that we can do throughout our lives, right? This morning we talked about them. We can flee. We can change the situation we find ourselves in. We can change the things around us that try to grab our attention away from God. Flee them. Two, resist the enemy. Mm -hmm. Seek after God. Part of that comes in talking to him this morning. Part of it comes in talking to him and saying, Jesus, I do need that deliverance that you talk about. Jesus, I do desire that way out that was mentioned in 1 Corinthians. And so I don't know if you have ever prayed before, but I even said, I even put here three points. There are three points. This is how I pray to God. When I find myself, and when I'm examining my heart, and I say, well, there's an area of my heart that isn't lining up with the character of God. There, there's still an area that the enemy has uh, uh, a, a green light in my, in my life. Uh, there's a prayer. That, there's three points that I try to pray, pray. One, when I pray, I ask God to forgive me. So we know God is our Father. God is holy. God is perfect and when there's times in my life that I find my life doesn't line up, the temptations are still real, that I'm still falling to myself, falling into sin, I ask God to forgive me. And I can go simply as, Father, I, I forgive me the way that I've treated my spouse this week, that I haven't honored her the way that you honor her. Father, forgive me for taking things in my own hands and taking pride in myself. Father, forgive me for seeking the desires of my flesh more than the desires of my spirit to seek after you. Forgive me. The Bible says that he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins. So we know the first point is, Father, forgive me. Forgive me for wronging. Forgive me for making a wrong decision. <coughs> and second, the second point that I always pray is the prayer of submission. Jesus, it's not only that forgive me for wronging you, but Jesus, I, I want to follow your way. So I submit myself again underneath the Lordship of Jesus. I say, Father, forgive me, I, I, have, I have wronged you in this way. I have dishonored myself this way. I've, I've mistreated my children this way. I've, I've cheated on this situation. And Jesus, I, I submit to your leadership. I submit to doing things the right way on, on paper. I submit to loving my children and, and, and making my home a place where they can fall in love with you. I, I submit to honoring my spouse the way that you honored the church. I, I desire to live that way. You're realigning yourself away from the enemy. You had once put the enemy, given him green light to follow his ways. Now you're saying, no, I'm submitting to Jesus' way. So I ask forgiveness. I, I resubmit to Jesus, to, to his perfect way. And then third, I ask for help. Yeah. See, what's amazing, and we read this in, in James, right, that God opposes the proud. He resists those that try to do it on their own. But he gives grace to the humble. He actually helps those who ask him for help. So I know this, if anything, I'm walking with Jesus, I know, I've learned, I can't do this on my own. There's no way that I can do this on my own. But with Jesus' grace, with the Father's help, with the Father's assistance, this is possible. There is hope to overcome the enemy in our life, who wants nothing more than to kill, steal, and destroy us. But God wants to bring life to us. And so our moment here, our, our decision of hope uh, to overcome temptation is this. That we pursue God with all of our heart. And we ask Him at every moment, God, give me grace. God, help me. That I would look more and more like you. And as we continue to pray the prayer like this, He will transform us. Yeah. Our life will change. Our situations will change. The, the things that the enemy once had control over our lives we will begin to see the enemy control loosen and God's goodness and blessing and his perfection flow in our lives. <coughs>
this morning in closing, I want us to be able to pray this prayer. I think we can't move away from this gathering without taking a moment to pray. Because I know none of us in this room are perfect. I stand here every couple of Sundays to preach. It doesn't mean that I have my life together. Pastor and those who are on stage here, we don't do anything differently than you do. We have the same kind of life. We have the same struggles. The enemy has the same ways with us. And so we have to examine our hearts and say, where is in our hearts also have I found room that the sin is still alive? Where in my heart do I need to still submit to Jesus as Lord? Where in my heart do I need to ask God for help that I would overcome the ways of the enemy? So why don't we bow our heads this morning? And I want to uh, take a moment and pray for you. And then we're going to have a few moments where you yourself, you can take time to pray, to ask the Father for forgiveness, to resubmit your life under the Lordship of Jesus, under His leadership, and to ask Him to help you have grace to overcome these things. He is a good father this morning. He is a good father this morning. He loves you with an everlasting love. He desires relationship with He's so different than an earthly father that maybe didn't have time for you. There may have been moments in your life where you would desire a conversation with your dad and, and, and he would just shoo you away. Maybe he had no time for you. But this morning, you have a heavenly father that says he loves you and desires for you to come and talk to him. So let me pray this morning. And if you want to use that model that I just gave you, you can do that. But ask the Lord for forgiveness. Submit again to Jesus as the best way and ask him for